call to order our uh, 44th public meeting of the Mass Gaming Commission, January 3rd, 2013. Happy New Year, everybody. Um, we will start off, as usual, with the approval of the minutes. Commissioner McHugh. Uh, the January, uh, uh, sorry, the December 18 minutes have been distributed. Uh, I think you, got, you all got yesterday a red line version, but the uh, version in the packets that's available for everybody uh, today is the one in which all those red line corrections have been accepted. So uh, uh, I would move, unless there's some corrections to be made, that the minutes be approved. Second. Just, just one tidy correction, third line up on page three in terms of jobs and economic development. Um, development, yeah. Development, okay. All in, fav um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Okay, um, on administration, uh, Director Glovsky stayed at the office today because we've got a lot of uh, action going with applications and paperwork and so forth, but there were just a couple of things that we wanted to look at on the master schedule. Um, we uh, had hoped that we would start getting applications, uh, fundamentally the completed applications. We'll talk more about this with Commissioner Cameron in it when we get to her agenda item, um, but we've been ready to start background checks uh, for a couple weeks now. And as you'll hear, we do have uh, a, a, a two or three, I think, of the uh, largely completed applications on board. So that's going to give us a little bit of a head start. And we're anxiously awaiting everything else. Um, all the other critical path items are going well. There is a lot of, this is writing the regulations for application phase two is uh, the big project going on right now along with the background checks and in this pro it's underway uh, and we're putting together a master schedule uh, we're pulling out those regs which we need to pull forward in order to try to move the slots process uh, forward expeditiously so we can try to get that done first this is the critical path for the slots I think that's May 1st we hope to have all the backgrounds done uh, by May 1st if not before uh, in order that we could have any hearings if there are appeals and then do the application process late in the summer. So we need to be sure we've got the regs all ready to go to match the finish, the completion of the background checks around the 1st of May. This process right here is largely or substantially driven by public process, either required process from Secretary of State, uh, executive order process from the governor, uh, and or what we just think is an appropriate amount of hearing time on these important regs. This is here at about three months. We think we can squeeze that down a little bit. Uh, and I've asked uh, Attorney Grossman along with Commissioner McHugh and, and our lawyers to see if we can tighten this up a little bit. But that is the, the, the slots, uh, background checks, and uh, regs, and leading to the licensing process is critical path item number one right at the moment and for the time being uh, it's going well and we anxiously await other complete completed applications so we can get everything else going um, there's nobody to scroll this so I won't bother scrolling the only other thing is um, we have our finalists for background our finalists for executive director in background check right now and we will be bringing them in for final public interviews uh, as soon as we have the background checks done, but we have agreed to complete background checks before we bring candidates in. Uh, other than that, um, I think uh, that's basically it for master schedule issues. Anybody else have questions or? Just a, a, a quick question or, or request or get some uh, some feedback. Now that we've signed off on the, on the MOU with the uh, the community colleges for the casino careers. Should we entertain adding that process at the bottom of yeah. our Gantt chart to kind of just follow their progress and success along the way? As Absolutely, well? I think we should. And uh, as you know, because you're the hiring manager, we're we're in the process of hiring a director for 
workforce supplier and, and diversity development, uh, that person hopefully will be on within a, within the month or so, and we'll need to have their own critical path chart. So okay. it's not really critical path exactly, but I think it would be a good addition. Okay. So maybe you could talk to uh, Director Glovsky about setting that up. Sure. Great. Great. Um, and I, I forgot to mention the obvious one, but the big one is January 15th is the final date, uh, the due date for, uh, again, we'll hear more about this from Commissioner Cameron, but for the, uh, the substantially completed applications and uh, the, uh, the $400,000 check. So we are, there's a lot going on right now, and we're looking forward expectantly to January 15th, which will be the date at which we will know for sure what the full lay of the land is uh, across the Commonwealth. Anything else on schedule issues? Um, okay, uh, item 3B, the employee manual. Commissioner Zuniga. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if it's okay with, uh, with all of the commission, I, I will uh, suggest that we postpone the, the vote on this um, chapter uh, for the uh, for the following reason, um, our in-house attorney, uh, Mr. Todd Grossman, has um, drafted uh, what I think is a very worthwhile and and, and good uh, piece of um, procedure that uh, pertains to uh, uh, responding to public records requests. And um, currently in our manual, we have uh, language uh, that deals with public records on, on, two, um, on two areas, in, in two chapters, if you will. And um, I believe this language would really go a long way in consolidating and clarifying uh, that procedure, which also appears in chapter six, which is the one that we have uh, in question. So given that, um, there's, there's this uh, good piece of uh, language I propose that um, I incorporate it accordingly in, um, in the chapters and come back next week to, um, for a vote of, um, of the commission. But I'll distribute that as we, I ha as we have been doing the, uh, in advance uh, to that vote for review and input of uh, the commission. That's fine. As long as we have this, does anybody have any comments? I, I've got a couple. Anybody? Um, well, just for the drafting and redrafting, yep. um, it seemed to, this may get included in what you're doing, but it seemed to me some kind of English language kind of heads up warning to our employees about FOIA requests. Um, it is startling to sit there and read back on all the emails you've written uh, and see what you've written. You just don't think about it when you're doing your ordinary day to day work. And it's important, I think, to, to warn people that every single thing they put in their email is susceptible to a public records request, and anybody in the world can be reading everything that they've written. <laughs> and uh, so I think somewhere in big, bold letters having something to that effect in this would, would be important. Um, on 6.2, there's this thing that says this section was adopted May 29. That, that looks yes. like it was just picked yep. up by accident. From nope. No, it, it actually, um, you may recall that uh, on May 29, we had an acceptable use policy that I oh, felt oh, okay. for computers, essentially, and networks, that at the time before we really started talking about a comprehensive employee manual, I thought was important to bring, and we did adopt that. Okay. That was a vote of the commission. Okay, so, um, great. All right. It was just as a clarifying note. Um, at the end of section 6.3, it says, with the exception of the director of communication and staff directly assigned to the communications department, all time and effort that an employee spends on a personal site should be done on the employee's personal time without use of any state resources. I don't understand why you'd make a distinction um, between the director of communications staff and everybody else about when they do personal things on their personal time. That? Uh, I think the intention of that was um, the social media. It, this is all in the um, in the context of Facebook and Twitter. Yeah. Uh, and um, but those aren't their personal sites. Those are well, 
MGC sites. That um, okay, I see. Was, the, the effort was to try to reconcile the fact that there will be legitimate business purposes um, of certain key yeah. employees. We 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 don't have to restrict it or okay. or, or or not. Well, it seems as it because it says an employee spends on a personal site, and these are the, the per communications people will not be spending time on personal sites. They'll be spending time on on McCormick Twitter. I mean on. Uh, Gaming Commission, Twitter, Correct. and Facebook. So Correct. that seemed a little odd to me. Sure. And then we can, we can um, change that. This uh, under six point five, it says the commission may assess a photocopying a printing fee of no more than ten cents per page. I thought the Secretary of State's rule was twenty cents a page. I could double check okay. that. Uh, um, uh, that. That may be uh, outdated. And then it also says the hourly rate is eighteen dollars an hour even if the persons doing the searching or photocopying have a higher pay rate. And again, my recollection, because I just went through this for something else, was that it would, be the, it would be the rate that is the highest required for the person to do the job. This is not a big deal unless we get a request, which is really an onerous request. Right, right, and which is why, why the may is there uh, and, and not a shall. In the in the the commission may impose a fee, it may waive right. it as well. But it constrains the hourly rate. And if if I had to spend three weeks going through all my emails, yeah. we wouldn't want to charge eighteen dollars an hour. Yeah, yeah. So I just double check. I those. I can double check. Okay. Um, those, those are the only two. Yeah. Just double check those two things. Yep. Um, okay. Anybody else? Okay. We will come back to that then uh, probably next week. Uh, item number four, the uh, Investigations and Enforcement Bureau report. Commissioner Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, with regard to scope of licensing, all of our scope of licensing, uh, the determination as to who the qualifier should be have gone out. Now, there is one more um, potential applicant speaking to our um, consultants, but that has not uh, progressed to the point where we need to make a determination at this point. Uh, so in other words, everybody that wants a background check, we have told them who we think has to have be included in the background check. Correct. Right. Now we are presently working with three of our applicants who um, would like to possibly redefine someone's role and or give us additional information for us to consider with regard to a qualifier. So those discussions are uh, ongoing. We have a meeting next week. We have a conference call. Um, and all of the uh, potential applicants have been told, look, this will not slow down the investigation. If there's additional work to be, be done, get the application in. We'll begin the application. And then if it takes us another week or so to determine exactly who the qualifiers are, that's fine. So I, I think we have a, a, an open dialogue with everyone with regard to where we are and what the process is. Um, moving on to investigations, uh, Plain Ridge Race Course has um, submitted an application which we have deemed sufficient and uh, turned over to our investigators in conjunction with the state police and that uh, background will commence immediately. In addition, we received uh, two more uh, submissions today, MGM and Penn National. Uh, MGM was in this morning and Penn National has either been there or will be this afternoon. The state police is there to take their, uh, take their submission. So that document review will start immediately. As soon as that's uh, deemed sufficient, those investigations will start. Um, as far as everyone else, they're very well aware of the 15th. Uh, and I'm just going to stress again the need to be thoughtful about the submission. Uh, all of the documents that we've requested and required um, should be there. Um, that will really help us with a timely investigation. Also, uh, as our regulations uh, state, they must be uh, in an electronic format. And if you could please... Um, if you're using a CD format, for example, the fewer CDs, the better. Not one CD or two for every single qualifier, but just really try to um, condense that information. Again, that will help us tremendously with, uh, with our end, which is to do uh, a sufficient, um, uh, timely investigation. So I appreciate in advance you working with us on that. And that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Great. 
we will be letting people let the public know as these applications are come in and are accepted as as sufficient to get the process going uh, and then at the end of the at the end of the schedule the 15th we'll obviously summarize where we're, where we stand for everybody okay item five key policy questions there um, uh, there's one down below on item seven but uh, I think really this was just a matter of making sure that we have a process in place for the next 20 or so questions and I think that's been set up 22nd and 23rd of January. right okay um, and whoever has those I guess knows they're coming in okay uh, and they are available for public comment no they were available for public comment before right okay um, I guess the only other thing here is we just need to be mindful as we track with the consultants as we run through this process you know actually part of your master schedule for the reg writing is to make sure that we're thinking ahead about are there issues that we need to address are there big policy questions that we need to address before regs can be written I think we've already done a lot of that but we need to just be mindful of that as the process continues to unfold okay uh, item six racing division how are you Director Durenberger. <clears throat> Excuse me. The racing division of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission did assume operations out at the racetracks on December 31st on Monday. Um, let's see here. We have some ongoing physical moving of inventory and electronic files uh, from DPL to our existing facility on 84 State Street. Uh, working on that, finishing that up this week, as well as extending into next week, should be completed by January 9th. Um, in your packet uh, is an audit, a copy of a final audit from the Office of State Auditors. This was the transition audit that you all had requested at the time <coughs> that you looked at the, um, I'm sorry, at the time of the transition when you assumed the fiscal responsibilities of the old State Racing Commission. Uh, I think you've seen it before in draft form, but this is the final form. And the conclusion was, um, and I quote, that the State Racing Commission had adequately administered operations, adequate controls in place to safeguard its assets, uh, adequate and complete accounting and contractual documentation, and complied with all applicable laws, rules, and regs for the areas tested. I think they did look at a little bit of the follow-up period as well from after you took control. Um, the local aid payments that we had discussed and that you voted on a couple of weeks ago, um, I'm happy to report that the 930 payment uh, was processed on December 26th. That was the first quarter FY13. The second quarter, uh, the 1231 payment is actually in process. It's just a matter of the funds from the ISA being transferred over uh, to the MGC's control. So that should be very timely, uh, which just leaves the fourth quarter FY12, which I think should also be very timely. Um, we have and that's the issue that is referred to that is the other in the matters. audit report. Yeah. Okay. Yep, the other matters at the end. And I think if I could just add uh, to supplement uh, what uh, Dr. Durenberger has said, that, that uh, after the audit uh, was uh, prepared and, and after we looked at the draft, we again looked at the legislation, the legislative intent, and, and looked at the progression of the statutory changes that affected these local aid payments and concluded that uh, that the uh, legislative intent was clear that these payments were to be made and uh, that uh, it was the appropriate thing to do because the cities and towns had budgeted for them. Uh, there were uh, a number of contingencies that uh, depended on the payments being made in timely fashion uh, and that given the, that the legislative intent was unquestioned when one looks at the entire history, uh, making those payments was the proper thing to do. So that is what led to the vote that we made uh, two weeks ago or on the 18th to make those payments and, and it's worth noting that that's how that was processed and furthermore we had the money sitting there for right. the for the purpose right right and for the for the for the uh, fiscal FY13 there was a specific <coughs> there was a specific appropriation designating particularly uh, those monies for that purpose so so that, that was uh, all of that led to the vote that we took on the 18th right great 
The Section 104 Legislative Review uh, report is due now at the end of this month, and we are in the final stages of distillation, if you will. Uh, we've identified four issues that we're going to put before you next week, <clears throat> at this meeting next week. Um, on a parallel track, we are right on target with our regulatory changes that we're recommending. Um, these are going to primarily be in the areas of medication and testing, which I think we've discussed, or at least touched on. Um, throughout the process since I came on board and I think beginning back in July when you had the consultants report. Uh, that's also going to come before you, on, I'm sorry, that's going to come before you at this meeting on the 17th. And that's all I have if you don't have any questions and for me. And personnel that are transitioning, what's the status of that? They're all working. Everyone who chose to come on board is working. And so, and that's enough to keep the ship It is, forward. it is. We have a couple of key hires that are going through background right now. And I think there's one position that we're going to repost for, but we certainly have the manpower to fill in the holes in the meantime. Okay. Good. And and office space and all that stuff? Work in all progress. Yep. Right. Okay. Great. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, Ombudsman uh, Ziemba is out with a sick kid, um, so I'm going to take uh, this item. The mage, I don't, I don't think. Well, on the on item one, in, uh, there's um, sort of relates to that. The governor's office has notified us that they have filled the labor seat on the gaming policy advisory committee. Uh, it's filled by Brian Lang, whom many of you know uh, from uh, Unite here. And um, he was the one to put us in touch with the agency that, that in, in Las Vegas that did that had all the training facilities, really interesting stuff. But we're still waiting on the governor's office to come up with a chair of the Gaming Policy Advisory Commission. They're working on it. And as soon as they have the chair, I think a number of the House and Senate members have been appointed. Uh, we're just waiting on the chair. And so we'll, we're anxious to get that going. And, and uh, Ombudsman Ziemba is working with the governor's office to try to move that along as quickly as possible. On, this, on question number 12 from our key policy questions, you have the briefing paper in your book, um, <clears throat> in your pack. The question was, to what degree will an applicant be required to have progressed in federal, state, and local permitting and other regulatory process before submitting its RFA2 application? Uh, he has done a lot of work on this, and he has submitted a set of recommendations here uh, since he's not here to talk about it, I'll run over it briefly, but he's really more familiar with it. And this will be published, um, and it's available for public comment by anybody that wants to talk further about this issue, if you haven't already. And then we will have a couple of people from the state come in next week from MEPA and uh, I think the Department of Transportation, and we will fine-tune this and have a formal vote on this outcome. But. Um, I, let me walk through his memo. Um, I, mean, I think the, sh the long, the short version of this is that the commission clearly has an interest in having these processes be moved as far along as possible because that enhances the whole process of moving the expanded gaming facilities to fruition as quickly as possible. To the extent that licensing in substantive ways is not complete, we will be obligated to grant a conditional license um, which, A, is less speedy, which raises all kinds of potential risks, um, and which may be taken back if the, the contingent mitigation activities are not able to be completed. Uh, in a perfect world, I think we would urge people to maybe even require people to have uh, be much further along in the process, but there are, there are time parameters, for, particularly for people who are new to the game, uh, there's no way they could get it all done, even if they tried. A and B, there is some reluct some reluctance to spend all the money for a full environmental uh, environmental uh, assessment um, before people know whether or not they're going to get their licenses. So uh, that is not his recommendation. Um, he uh, he says that a requirement that all projects rec secure all necessary permits prior to licensure would be unreachable, and he goes on to say uh, is expensive, and many people, many legitimate bidders would probably not want to incur that expense. Um, 
problems, however, are that if it's not completed, as I said, there, were, there will likely be conditional approvals, conditional on local and state permitting. Um, we will be weighing readiness to proceed and readiness to get into the ground and to get operating as one of the criteria for, uh, a, uh, for judging the projects. So to the extent that a proposer elects not to pursue the permitting, that will have some impact. How much, we will be talking about, but it will have some impact. Um, Third, the Ombudsman is here to help, uh, so we will, the Ombudsman will be trying to facilitate the process with the state as much as possible um, and uh, in order to move things forward even without the requirement that the permitting be mandated. Um, and then he points out that there, once we get the licenses awarded, uh, we have within the statute the ability to put conditions for construction deadlines, and there are very big penalties uh, associated with failure to meet those. Uh, so there, in other words, there are other ways for us to comply speedy construction beyond the, uh, the permitting pre-licensing. Um, he recommends that the commission not specifically mandate com completion of local and state permitting. However, he does recommend that we require uh, the, the filing of the environmental notification form, ENF. Um, he encourages bidders to complete of what's called an expanded ENF, which will shortcut the process post-award uh, if you're able to do it. Uh, his, I want to read this, MAPC wrote in about the ENF process uh, applicants should be required to file both ENF and receive a certificate from the Secretary of the Executive Office of en Energy and Environmental Affairs um, prior to uh, being a full-blown applicant with us. MAPC wrote, the ENF lays out all potential categories of impacts that will be addressed in the full draft environmental impact report. Although the ENF won't provide the final impact analysis, it will identify the potential significance of the various impacts and identify potential fatal flaws in any proposal. This will allow the Commission to review each application with an understanding of all the potential impacts, economic, transportation, environmental, etc., that may affect the viability or likelihood of a permittable project. Initially, because the ENF requires 21 days for public comment, it would also keep the process transparent and provide, it provide added uh, opportunities for public input. Um, so. Uh, Ombudsman Ziemba is agreeing with MAPC that that's an appropriate standard. Uh, he, he describes, I won't bother going into it, um, the, the expanded ENF, uh, what else would be involved in that. Um, and he mentioned, he goes through a bunch of the other, uh, the other certificates that are likely to be required but that he's not recommending that we do require. We then talked with the state about help. We had, we had talked about having an expedited permitting process post-license award. This is something Commissioner McHugh had uh, been talking about for months. Um, and the agencies made it clear that if the MEPA process is not completed, there will be no really <laughs> expedited permitting, because you've got to get through the MEPA process, which is the big time sink. Um, but if you are through the MEPA process, there can be quite an expedited process. And in any event, uh, we got help from the eight state agencies, particularly Energy and Environmental Affairs and Transportation. They will, excuse me, they will work on our teams to help us review the applications and to make judgments about the mitigation efforts, uh, to make judgments about conditional licenses where necessary. Um, and as has already been the case, uh, we will coordinate with the agencies, with any applicant that wants to try to get teed up as far as they possibly can in the, in, in the ENF or expanded ENF process. And finally, he recommends that we basically not get involved in requiring local permitting 
but um, says, I think he says that it's, yes, that it is recommended that the commission consider requiring applicants to demonstrate consistency with local zoning prior to the award of a conditional license following the commission's review of a filed RFA2 application. The standard for approval of zoning changes is higher than the standard of a referendum. Um, you may require a supermajority of a town meeting or of some other kind of a, of a governmental body, and you could have a referendum approving a variety of activities in a host community agreement, mitigation efforts, and they could fail at a, at a zoning uh, appeal board process. So he is recommending that we require effectively proof of zoning compliance. And I think that's the gist of it. Um, I'm, ha I'm happy to talk about it if anybody wants, uh, but um, we're mostly going to be interested in here. This will be posted tomorrow, I guess, if not later today. Uh, and anybody that has comments, we're interested in hearing them. Uh, and then, as I said, we'll have representatives of the state agencies in next week to fine tune all of this. Um, I, I, uh, I, which, which is a great approach, and I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, to any more comments and, and more discussion. I, I had one, one thought on this notion of uh, readiness to proceed, and. Um, which is, I, I think we, we it'd be incumbent upon us to try to differentiate two benefits that are derived from, from that notion. Uh, the clear one are uh, the revenues and the jobs, if you will, the economic impact by virtue of a casino uh, or a integrated resort, if you will, opening as, as soon as practically possible. And uh, the other one that I believe uh, uh, Mr. Ziemba alludes to eloquently is one of risk mitigation right. or uh, the ability to come to fruition on a project at all by virtue of the permitting that needs to happen or, or uh, other factors that start to come in as zoning, um, uh, et cetera. So um, in, in my mind, uh, the benefits um, from, from revenue and economic impact are um, very straightforward to, uh, to analyze and, and, uh, and evaluate, you know, with a, some, some discounted cash flow and some um, model, uh, financial model, if you will. Uh, maybe to a lesser degree, the, the jobs, but there is still uh, an economic impact benefit. Um, the other one that he does allude to, uh, one of risk mitigation, should really be uh, thought through in, in, in those terms, in my opinion. And, um, and that's just a point that um, we should consider, we should continue to think about uh, as we put out the detailed criteria for evaluating these proposals. But I see those two as perhaps worth differentiating. Yeah, yeah and that's, a good dis that's a useful distinction. I, my, I, the thing I was going to say is 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 broader, uh, and I think this uh, memorandum and this subject is as important as any subject we've taken up thus far, because it shows that um, although we're at the hub of a large wheel, the wheel is large, and it has a number of spokes. Uh, some of these projects we've already heard from planning authorities are the biggest things that have ever been planned in the region where they're going, there isn't any precedent in some cases for uh, the processes uh, to get through all of the uh, steps that have to be taken before the uh, appropriate permits can be granted. Uh, and there are th at least three levels of permitting uh, that have to be obtained. There's the state uh, uh, permitting, there may in some cases be the federal, but uh, mostly the state and then the local uh, permitting, which has to be uh, done uh, as well. Um, all of this, as uh, the chairman, uh, you pointed out as you, as you highlighted the memorandum, uh, may require zoning changes, um, and the zoning changes may require a supermajority. So the interlocking pieces here uh, that have to come together in order for these projects to actually proceed to fruition and the degree to which we can be assured that they will come to fruition when we grant a conditional license 
getting to your risk mitigation point, Commissioner Zinnigan, uh, seem to me to be critical uh, pieces at the center of what we're doing, for we can assess and analyze and weigh and make extrapolations about a whole variety of things, but unless all this, uh, these various permitting requirements are satisfied, none of that's going to matter. So I uh, simply say that in the hope that by posting this, uh, all who are interested in this, developers, uh, uh, members of the community, planning uh, councils will comment uh, so that we can have the benefit of their thoughts and insights as we proceed to make judgments about uh, the key question, which is what should we require in terms of uh, uh, permitting proce uh, progress uh, before we issue even a conditional license. And, and I think that's really at the hub of, of uh, uh, a whole series of important questions. Yeah, there's a lot of consequence questions too. You know, there, there's one thing that one thing that uh, Ombudsman Zamba points out is that that is a practical matter. A lot of people couldn't get very far down the process, right. even if they tried, even right. if we required it. And you know, I think we've been clear that we're not gonna we're not gonna overly penalize people for being late to the party. You know, we want latecomers and and early comers to be have a shot, um, but. Um, but that does raise the issue of material changes between what ultimately gets approved and what was in the HCA, what was in the referendum, and we've never dealt with what we will do under those circumstances. And we'll get there. We don't have to have dealt with it yet, but that's part of that big wheel and right. with many spokes, I think. It's, it's a pretty complicated puzzle. And it, it probably is not a, a good use of private or public resources to get beyond a certain point in the permitting process until the applicant knows that he or she is going to get the license. On the other hand, uh, the license is dependent to some extent on the feasibility and right, right. realistic. So we, we're in a classic chicken and egg situation. Right. And happily, the, the, uh, the uh, various uh, permitting agencies throughout the state are uh, fully engaged in uh, a collaborative process to the extent that the statutes allow them. And uh, so how to make that how to make that um, interconnection work uh, as, as smoothly as possible to speed these things along uh, with appropriate safeguards for the statutory uh, interests is the challenge that is posed by this memorandum. And, and that's why I, I, I think, and I think we probably all agree, it's so important to, to talk about and to get public input about. Right. Yeah, and I think, I think John will shift that, you know, he'll, he'll naturally shift into the role of being the facilitator of first proposers and then and then licensees, conditional licensees. Right. And he has a good background for that. But still, I think having us oversee that is something you've been concerned about right from the very beginning. Right. And trying to make sure we've got management tools that facilitate it. Right. All the state agencies are, as you say, are very, very proactively supportive. They want to make this happen. Uh, the governor's made it a priority to get the, the licensees up and running as quickly as possible. So all the, the best intentions will be there, but we know what the road to hell is paved with, and getting it, you know, the process really right will be important. So, so that's, a, that's a good point. Okay. Um, that's it, I think, for public education information. We have no other uh, forms or anything coming up. Um, item number eight, charitable gaming. Commissioner McHugh. Uh, Colleagues, this, let me put this in context. Um, and uh, Todd uh, Grossman, who's our associate counsel, would you just take a seat at the table there? I'm, there may be some things that I've missed. You've been working uh, diligently on the execution of this uh, as well. So let, let me try and run through it and, and jump in if I, if I skip anything here. But to put this in context, you'll recall that um, chapter, uh, section uh, uh, four of chapter 23K of the expanded gaming, uh, which is the expanded gaming uh, legislation, uh, gave us uh, control, uh, some authority over charitable gaming effective July 31 of 2012. Uh, the legislation also required us to take a look at existing charitable gaming statutes and make recommendations as to changes. Uh, and to file a report with the legislature. We did that. We, we uh, looked at the charitable gaming legislation. 
Uh, we filed a, a report after consultation with the Attorney General's office, which has some role in regulating charitable gaming, and the lottery, which has another role in charitable gaming. And that report, which the Commission approved, uh, recommended that all of the charitable gaming regulation be transferred to the lottery with uh, continuing supervision over charities as a whole uh, by the Attorney General's office. The lottery, the Treasury, the Attorney General, and we all agreed to that. And in the report, we said that we would file by year's end legislation designed to do that. What's before you now is that legislation. And the legislation basically does uh, a couple of things in broad scheme. It, <clears throat> first of all, uh, seeks, uh, uh, would, if, uh, if enacted, repeal uh, the portion of uh, General Laws, Chapter 23K, Section 4, that gives us authority over charitable gaming. That statute gave us authority over a very narrow segment of charitable gaming and did it in, in the context of overlapping jurisdiction over the same subject by others. So in order to transfer uh, and consolidate charitable gaming with the Treasury and with the lottery, with the lottery, I should say, uh, uh, that, section is, um, that section is repealed. A, section, a second repeal is a segment of the uh, legislation that regulates Bino uh, that gives Beano licensees a particular route to running a lottery or a Monte Carlo night, which is statutorily a bazaar. There's a special section that gives them a, a route to doing that. Uh, and uh, that section also it would be repealed by this legislation because now they, like everybody else, would be subject to uh, the general mechanism for getting permission to run a lottery or run a bazaar slash Monte Carlo. The rest of what's before you is a modification of the basic charitable gaming statute, which is uh, General Laws Chapter 271, Section 7A. And that section has been modified to deal with um, uh, basically three topics. The uh, modifications from existing law are highlighted in the document that's before you. But there are basically three um, major themes that those modifications uh, uh, embrace. The first is simply making things more clear. The statute, and uh, 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 Council Grossman has uh, taken the existing statute, which doesn't have any subsections and is one long sort of Jack Kerouacian um, <laughs> explanation of how you get through this and he's broken it into subsections so that people can go to various uh, uh, places and, and uh, communicate uh, parts to others. So, and, and then some other clarifying language has been added. The second uh, theme is uh, to correct some uh, problems and issues that had grown up and that either the lottery or the Attorney General's office had noticed. The, an example of that is in uh, the very first section, 7A, uh, which now authorizes explicitly uh, so-called 50-50 raffles. They are raffles in which the winner of the raffle gets 50% of the total pool that was accumulated by the raffle. Uh, there is, uh, because of a variety of pieces of legislation, some doubt as to whether that uh, heretofore had been legal. It's widespread. It, it happens. <coughs> And uh, none of the uh, people responsible for regulating charitable gaming think that uh, there's any problem with it. So this explicitly authorizes what is, in fact, a widespread uh, process. And, and there are some other uh, places where that is done. Uh, the third is to consolidate. The third theme is consolidation in the lottery and the attorney general's <coughs> office of the functions that a charitable gaming operator uh, must perform. The charitable gaming operator must be registered as a charity with the Public Charities Division of the Attorney General's Office. The charity uh, bazaar night must be run by members of the organization, not people who come in and run it for the charity. The charity must file a tax return giving uh, the appropriate amount of money uh, uh, to the lottery. 
Uh, they were always required to do that. That's not a change, but now it's made explicit in the statute. And so the statutory changes in that regard uh, define and emphasize the functions uh, now assigned um, to the applicant vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Attorney General's Public Charities Division and the, and the uh, lottery and make that uh, much clearer than it had been in the past. And I suppose there's a fourth uh, theme, although it's a minor theme because it's, it's not a really um, a significant problem, although it does uh, crop up from time to time, and that is uh, an increase in the penalties for running an unauthorized lottery um, or Monte Carlo night or charity uh, or uh, or uh, bazaar, uh, and those penalties have in this legislation been increased. So that's the theme. Uh, the proposal now would be to discuss it if there are any questions, uh, uh, and then uh, to vote on its adoption. Uh, to file it with a short letter to the legislative leadership, the same people we addressed the last one to, uh, and then to have it, um, uh, uh, seek to have it introduced uh, in the legislature and um, uh, move forward. There is one uh, area here that is not in this legislation for a variety of reasons, but may uh, still require some work, and, and that can be done after the legislation is filed, and that is, um, a request by at least some city and town clerks uh, that we noted in our report to the legislature that small lotteries, lotteries under a certain amount of money, be exempted almost entirely from this regulation with the exception of the need to pay taxes on the, on the yield. Uh, that is um, something on which there was a difference of opinion slightly among uh, the three groups, the AG, the Treasury, uh, the Lottery, and, and uh, us, and uh, more work uh, uh, perhaps would yield uh, a consensus and uh, the legislation could be uh, changed uh, uh, before it is finally uh, put up to a vote. So that now is a summary of what's in front of us. Have I, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I think that? that covers it. Okay. So que uh, questions or discussion or how will you choose yeah, to proceed, Mr. Chairman? I I'd like to uh, have, I have a question or, or uh, maybe uh, a, a comment, if you will. Um, by bazaars, um, as, as you uh, point out, these, these um, are uh, what's normally the, the Vegas night or the Monte Carlo night right. um, that, uh, that uh, have had some popularity uh, in, in, in recent times. And um, I was wondering if that definition um, ought not to have some uh, games associated with with that, or, or, uh, or more of an explanation of what may include, um, uh, may be included in a bazaar. Because the way the definition reads, at least to me, is that um, it's only a place as opposed to the kind of activity that would take place there. Um, on, a, on, a, on a related note, uh, I was wondering if uh, the disposal, where it, where it reads that for disposal by means of chance, uh, um, chance or skill um, would be a relevant addition uh, in the context of how there's recent decisions by some, uh, by, I'm going to forget the judge that, uh, that uh, um, in another state determined that uh, poker was in fact a game of skill. Uh, not a game of chance. Um, so anyway, in, in the context of uh, poker nights, I was just wondering if we could be a little bit more uh, prescriptive in terms of that definition of bazaar. Well, uh, if, if, if it's a game of skill, it's not gamble, because the definition of gambling is a price for a chance for a prize. All three elements have to coalesce. And so if one of those is missing, if skill replaces chance, you don't have gambling. So it's not regulable under this kind of a regime or any other gambling regime. You start with that premise, and that's how you move to regulation of gambling. Uh, insofar as bazaar is uh, concerned, um, I guess the only response I would have is that this term has been in place and has acquired a meaning 
among those who do this kind of thing for about 40 years. And there's no reason we can't change it. But going into it, the idea was we change as little as necessary because at all levels uh, of government that are involved in this, from the Department of Public Safety to the Treasury to the Attorney General down to the town clerks and the police officers who are actually uh, uh, doing the enforcement, uh, it's understood what this is. These are the uh, uh, Monte Carlo Knights with the roulette wheels and the craps tables and the, and the things that have a fixed prize uh, as opposed to a, play, uh, a, a contest against a pool uh, or a contest against the house. You are, you are playing for a fixed prize, and that's really what this was designed to do. So we, we could, we could uh, go back to the group and propose a change if, if uh, the commission feels strongly about it. But that's the, that's the reason right. for it. So, so maybe uh, the, the question really is then, uh, under this, um, under the way this is drafted, uh, could somebody conduct a poker tournament? Um, and be uh, could a charity conduct a poker tournament, invite people for to ante up an entrance fee, um, and uh, would would, it, would that be activity be regulated or not? Perhaps is my fundamental question under these. It, it, it would it, well it would be regulated. Uh, there are regulations because the 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 can. It, under this, um, under this definition of bazaar, the prizes can only be merchandise or a cash award of not more than $100. And the way these things work is people accumulate chips or uh, credits, and they get a prize. The prize isn't dependent on the odds in the usual sense. The prizes are based on, on, uh, on uh, uh, limitations and the chits and regulations promulgated by uh, the Attorney General and, and by the lottery that will now be promulgated by the lottery, and they'll be the same. So that the, the way that, that the prizes are awarded uh, for games of chance is uh, dependent on the regulations that show how the credits are accumulated toward a prize that uh, can be no more than $100. So that's the way that is handled, but I suppose that a poker <coughs> night could be done so long as those conditions are met. But I think your point is that it wouldn't be covered. And so, we're, yes, your my, my fear. We're not regulating. Yes. Do, does it matter that we're not covering poker nights? Right. Well, I'm not sure that we aren't covering poker nights. Uh, as long as there is a charitable purpose and they otherwise conform to the regulations. I think this language has historically covered poker nights. I think it's an interesting case you, you reference, and someone would have to come in and argue, hey, I can just do this because that's a game of skill. Uh, but that's something that they would have to undertake. Uh, they risk to, some of the penalties, obviously. They risk the penalties, uh, and whether it's worth it, I, I guess, is up to them. I didn't think of this until Commissioner Zuniga brought it up. I could I didn't understand what Bazaar referred to because I've never done that. I didn't know it had a had had a meaning in a certain environment. Whether the fact that it has a meaning in a certain environment, which is not accessible to a regular person or not, is a judgment. I guess somebody else got to whether that matters is going to have to make somebody else got to make a judgment. I couldn't read this and have any idea of what was being described. But I don't know whether that matters or not. My other question was whether, and, and I, under, I, I understand the point of the historical um, um, context and the meaning that it has acquired through the years, but whether it's incumbent upon anybody uh, to define the games, uh, to, to distinguish between uh, roulette and um, blackjack, perhaps, that have certain odds, everybody understands, etc. Wow. And um, well, or well, a poker. Yeah, or, or a poker because uh, a poker tournament because that's perhaps a different uh, kind of game where uh, at least different uh, the opinions may differ as to whether that involves more skill. Uh, so I mean, th this was again a rhetorical question as to whether it's incumbent upon um, us or anybody 
to try to define those those games that may take place in a bazaar. Uh, I know it's not necessarily the route that this was envisioned to go, but I'm coming from what could potentially, hopefully not, be competing, uh, uh, a competing uh, activity, if you will, with the casinos that we are going to regulate. Well, if, you, if, if the Commission feels strongly about that, we can certainly table this and uh, do some further research. My sense is that, uh, as I think about it now, and frankly, I had, I, because I have a view of the Monte Carlo Knights in the context in which they've historically been carried out, my sense is that poker is um, a game played against a pool as, a, as opposed to a game played against the house, and that it likely is therefore prohibited by uh, the statutes that gave rise to the problem with respect to the 50-50 raffle. And, um, uh, but we can do some further research uh, on that and postpone this for um, uh, further discussion at some future point uh, while we do that research to make sure that, uh, that poker is uh, uh, whatever we want to do with poker. Um, uh, and um, uh, see whether or not uh, uh, poker could be uh, done in one of these uh, charitable bazaars. I'm even thinking out loud on that note. Uh, I wonder if, as part of this research, we could also uh, research whether we have or should exercise uh, an authority of tort by regulation. Um, whether we have that authority, first of all, to uh, to issue clarifying regulations towards that activity. Well, the, the, the whole purpose of this. Uh, uh, is to transfer regulatory authority to yes. somebody else. Right. We're out of the business. And, well, and I would be <coughs> no, no, I, to I, just I, keep our finger <laughs> in the pool. Um, Perhaps I, I mis mischaracterized it. If, if it's not covered under, if an activity like poker is not covered under charitable gaming because that's all understood by all the parties, does it then uh, fall under the purview of this commission? And I'm just, I'm just asking a rhetorical question, perhaps, at this point. Are you what? speaking of poker at an event like this? Or at any other event. Um. Well, we regulate, we regulate casinos and, and uh, slots parlors. And uh, to the extent that somebody is uh, running a craps uh, game uh, in a back alley or uh, a basement, uh, we don't have regulatory, uh, regulatory authority over them. That's part of the criminal law process. So I'm not sure we'd want to be regulating, uh, issuing regulations about criminal enterprises. So I, I think that part is covered. It's covered. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but we certainly, if the commission is uh, disposed to do so, uh, do further checking on the um, on the. Uh, poker in bazaars and come back with certainty as to whether that is permissible or not. My sense is, as I said, that it's not. Is there some other section? What this does is defines two kinds of activities and then says that under certain circumstances you may do them. Right. What if you had a bazaar that had cash awards in excess of $100? Is there some place that says you can't do that? Yes, the general gambling laws say you can't. So that's either. all right. So this is this this, this, this is fitting this. under someplace else that says you can't gamble. Right. But this, but under these conditions, you can. Yeah, gamble. and I think that's important to understand. Yeah. Uh, that this <clears throat> this is an exception to the general prohibition against gambling in Massachusetts. Indeed, the whole casino law is an exception right. to the general prohibition against gambling in Massachusetts. So that's how this has to right. be written. Okay. I had another sort of question too. Can an organization conduct more than three raffles? Uh, the subsection B two here talks about bazaars. Right. They can. They can. But conduct. they can do conduct any number of raffles. Right. And that's intended. That's intentional. That's historically been so, and uh, and you, uh, I can think of a number of sporting events to which one goes, and there's a raffle every night, uh, and that's. Uh, done under the permit that they have. They have to file and they have to pay taxes on it, but the permit is good for a year and they can conduct any number of raffles they want. 
Go ahead. Yeah, um, just a quick question of clarification. We reference on page four the Commissioner of Public Safety. I'm assuming that's the State Secretary of Public Safety? No, that's the Department of Public Safety under the Secretariat. Okay. I don't, I don't want to make a mountain out of a mole here. Maybe, maybe what we would do, if it was okay with you, would be to go ahead and accept this as written, but ask you to ask the, the little working group two questions. One is, is this definition of bizarre sufficient to do the trick, A, and B, um, it, does it cover poker games? And if, if your working group thinks that this is a big enough deal to, to edit the language, then we would defer that judgment to them. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense That to makes you? total sense, yeah. Okay, that, that, that's a way to move this right. forward and still preserve the concerns that were expressed here today. So right. I think that's an appropriate way to do it, and, and we'll do that. Okay. Yep. Just one other kind of quick grammatical Sorry. correction if we... I saw it on page three under G. Uh, if the clerk so determines he shall forward the application, should we just make a clarification of he slash she? Yes. And further down, we also talk about the chief of police. And use this uh, the, the um, masculine pronoun as well? Uh, the feminine pronoun as well. What we're missing. No, I mean, it, 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 as written, yeah. it just it just uses the message. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's a good catch. It, there's, uh, that same is in little I too. If that matters. Yeah. We'll go. We'll, we'll go through that and, and yeah. uh, make sure we've done that. That that's important, and we should do that. Okay. Anything else? You want to move the action as described? So I I move then, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, the um, commission. Uh, uh, approve uh, the language of the draft charitable gaming legislation that's before us with the exception of section 7, uh, the definition of bizarre in section 7A uh, 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 pending, um, uh, pending uh, further consideration by the Attorney General's Office the, the, and the uh, lottery uh, and with the thoughts expressed here today, and pending a uh, uh, alteration of the language uh, as necessary to ensure that uh, all of the pronouns are gender, gender neutral, um, and that the uh, legislation so approved be forwarded to uh, the appropriate uh, legislative leadership. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Nice habit. <coughs> okay. Item number nine, Attorney Grossman. Practice of law by out-of-state attorneys. We've uh, included a memo on this issue in your packet. Uh, in a nutshell, the uh, rules require that anyone who practices law before this body be uh, a member of the Massachusetts Bar, uh, unless they petition the commission for leave to practice. Uh, and in doing so, they would have to demonstrate three things, as I've outlined here, and as it's outlined in uh, uh, section 107.02 of the regulations. They have to uh, show that they are a member of a bar in good standing in all of the jurisdictions for which they are admitted. Uh, that there are no disciplinary proceedings pending against them in any of those uh, jurisdictions, and three, that they have read and are familiar with our uh, governing laws, Chapter 23K uh, and 205 CMR. Their petition then has to be presented by a member of the Massachusetts Bar, who themselves is in good standing, who then basically assumes a number of obligations. Uh, first, that they will re represent uh, the client concurrently with that out-of-state attorney, that they will appear of record in the particular matter with the out-of-state attorney, that they will be responsible for the conduct, ultimately, of the out-of-state attorney, and that they agree to co-sign, basically, all uh, documents submitted on behalf of the client to the commission. And if those uh, uh, conditions are all met, then the regulations provide that an out-of-state attorney can practice uh, before the board. 
So as we're moving forward, we've actually received two petitions already. And my recommendation to you, uh, where this is largely a, a ministerial type process, it's largely practiced in the courts of the Commonwealth and across the, the nation, really. It's called Pro Hoc Vice, where we, it's a reciprocity type uh, uh, petition that you just allow the legal staff of the commission to review these applications and approve them, assuming that they meet all the requirements of the regulations, um, and issue uh, the according uh, notice to the petitioners. Uh, in doing so, we will uh, just check to make sure that the sponsoring attorney, if you will, from Massachusetts is in good standing with the Massachusetts Bar. Um, and to the extent there are any issues, we'll, we'll bring them before you. But I, I think that will uh, satisfy the requirements uh, of the regulation and the concerns of the commission, and, and including this provision in the regulations. Building your empire already. Trying to add on to <laughs> everything. Any discussion? This is a thoughtful approach. Uh, to this uh, uh, issue which will arise. Uh, it's uh, modeled on the way the courts do it, and uh, it's, a, it's a thoughtful uh, approach to a continuing, pro uh, continuing issue. I, I think the timing is, is, uh, is very good. Also, I've been asked this particular question and frankly didn't told them that I would get back to them on this matter. So I appreciate you taking a look and having an answer for us. Um, and I assume this would, uh, this would apply to the racing division as well? I think so, yeah. Okay. Because we, we have had instances where out-of-state attorneys have wanted to represent, so we'll have to make that clear. Right. It's a, it, most attorneys are aware of the general process. The only difference between this and the pro hoc vice process is the lack of a fee here. You have to actually pay the Massachusetts Bar Association, uh, Board of Bar Overseers to do it in the courts. And you don't have to do that here. Otherwise, I think it's nearly identical. Why? Just why? Why would we not <coughs> charge the whatever the fee is? That uh, I think we could. It just wasn't included oh, okay. wasn't uh, in, in the, the regulations. Right, right. Okay. Okay. Um, do we need to? I think uh, that's a decision we made <coughs> without much uh, thought. The, the revenue stream that would be generated by a fee would be inconsequential and it's a burden. Yeah. I think that's why we didn't put it in the regs. Right. Do we need to vote on this? Uh, yes, Might I think we well. should because yeah. we the yeah. regs we're talk about things authority. that we're yeah. delegating right. authority. So I would move that the recommendation uh, made by uh, council uh, for uh, uh, admitting lawyers from other jurisdictions to practice before the commission be adopted and uh, be adopted, period. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. For our quick, our quick New Year's meeting, our New Year's resolution, no long meetings. We have a motion to adjourn. Uh, do, Mr. Chairman, is it Sorry. worth uh, yep. Sorry. saying that, that, that we, uh, I think we have, uh, designated Thursdays at this time to be the new time? as opposed to Tuesdays for these meetings right. going forward. Yeah, that should be, I know that it, it's, it's it, it impacted the life schedules of a number of people who had had Tuesdays scheduled throughout the year, so right. I know the word is out there. So yeah, our meetings will now routinely be Thursday for as long as we think we continue to need regular Thursday, regular weekly meetings. All right, motion to adjourn. So moved. All right, all in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you.